All right, welcome to a lecture of biomolecular dynamics and controls. And today we're going to talk about three things. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, what if we have a bunch of data and that data has a bunch of paired measurements of concentration of substrate. And also, um, we've measured the rate of formation of product. So we know this relates back to the reaction enzyme plus substrate reversibly binds to form a complex. And that complex can then irreversibly form a product and regenerate the enzyme. So we've measured the time rate of change of product formation and also the current concentration of substrate. And, um, and from this data, we want to fit we want to fit a um, Michaelis constant that would be associated with the first reaction. And we also want to fit a, a Vmax, which we know was equal to the total enzyme concentration times the second reaction's rate constant. So we basically, um, we have a bunch of S's and the corresponding DPDTs that are associated with this reaction, and we want to fit to it the Michaelis constant and the max velocity, which is whatever the DPDT would be in the limit of um, in, the, in the limit of uh, excessive substrate. The second thing we're going to talk about today is we're going to take a step back and we're going to only look at like a reaction that is similar to just the first part of that reaction. And we're going to, um, and when we, and when the enzyme doesn't catalyze the thing that it's binding to to form a product, we talked about it instead of an enzyme and a substrate, we talked about it in terms of a uh, receptor and a ligand reversibly binding to form a complex. And we talked about a dissociation constant associated with, um, that's capital K sub D. We talked about a dissociation constant associated with, with this reaction. So we're going to be able to um, take some of these things, manipulate them in a way, and we're going to be able to plot We're going to plot stuff. I'll talk in detail about what exactly we're plotting um, in a way in a way that we can more easily get the dissociation constant than having the dissociation constant kind of buried in a bunch of chemical reactions. The final thing we're going to talk about is what if we have a receptor and a ligand binding, but for example, our receptor is a little bit funky and has our receptor is a little bit funky and has multiple sites that the ligand can bind to. So if we have you know a couple of ligands forming, does the binding of one ligand to one site? influence the receptor's ability to have ligands bind to its other site. So what if what if a receptor has multiple sites? And does that affect the ligand's ability to bind? And it turns out for some receptors, um, the binding of one ligand may actually make it easier for other ligands to bind. And for other receptors, 
the binding of a ligand may make it more difficult for other ligands to bind. And this introduces the nature of cooperativity. Okay, so let's get started on this first point here, where we have a bunch of data. We have paired measurements of DPDT and uh, substrate concentration, and we want to uh, manipulate our expression uh, that relates DPDT and S in order to more easily extract um, the Michaelis constant and the max, um, the max rate of DPDT. So this is the nature of determining uh, parameters experimentally. So if you dig back in your notes, we had a relationship between dp, dt, and s in the limit of rapid equilibrium. So in in rapid equilibrium, we had dp, dt was equal to um, K2 times E0 times S divided by K M prime plus S, where S was the concentration of substrate, E0 is the total concentration of all enzymes, either bound or unbound, K2 is the rate constant um, associated with the second reaction, and K M prime is the Michaelis constant, which is a dissociation constant associated with the first reaction. So we could, we reformulated, we noticed that we, we never really had K2 and E0 appear independently from one another. So we called this Vmax. So we can't really independently observe what E0 and K2 um, are unless we like run the experiment with a bunch of different enzyme concentrations. So for a particular enzyme concentration, we said, all right, we'll just lump these together at Vmax. Um, and if we think about DPDT, we can um, call this quantity V. So rather than kind of write out DPDT each time, when I talk about V, um, that will stand for DPDT in this reaction. So we can say V is equal to Vmax times S over Km prime plus S. And the relationship between V and Vmax would be as if S went to infinity, then we get infinity over infinity. These would cancel out. Km prime would become negligible. So we'd have V approaching Vmax. So what does this look like graphically? So take a moment now, pause the video, and construct what a curve of V versus S would be. So we've constructed similar graphs in, um, in the past. We know that as S goes to infinity, um, V should approach V max. So we can draw in an asymptote right here. We could say we have V max right here. We also know that there's some point right here, let's say one half, one half V max. And when S, has a concentration of the Michaelis constant, then we get S over, um, so when S has a concentration of Michaelis constant, we get V max times Km prime over Km prime plus Km prime, or one half V max when S equals, equals the particular concentration that is our Michaelis constant. So, so what is this? Well, that's just if we have S equal to Km prime, then we know we're kind of halfway up to what our maximum velocity is. So we can construct a curve that looks like this. So a lot of times experimentally, we can't have, we can't measure every possible concentration of substrate here. So what we do is we just get a bunch of points 
and maybe those points have some noise, something like that. But if we get a broad range of S's and the corresponding V's that go to them, hopefully we can fit some curve that goes through them. And once we fit this curve, that curve will have associated with it the parameters Km prime and V max. Okay, so we do an experiment. So we measure, we measure a bunch of DPDT, i.e. Vs, and um, and the corresponding S's, and those are all of these red points that we could trace out um, on the plot here. But there might be a couple of tricky things associated with this experiment. So thing number one might be um, with noise or if so with noise or if we don't measure very high levels of s the asymptote the asymptote may not be obvious. So for example, if we only had this part of the curve, we know there might be enough data to sort of predict where that curve is asymptoting to, but we might not be able to precisely quantitatively infer what it is, for example, um, as compared to if we had data that went all the way out, um, such that the curve really did approach Vmax. So, um, so we want a way to be able to maybe guess what Vmax might be, even if the curve didn't go all the way there. Another, um, another drawback is if there's noise, we might have a bunch of um, DPDTs that are sort of bouncing up and down and kind of hovering around this value, but it might not be uh, obvious which one of those is exactly Vmax or really if any of those are. So we want a way to basically take a bunch of measurements and combine them all together over the whole range of S's that we have in order to infer a good value for Km and a good value for K. Uh, for uh, Vmax, for Vmax. All right, but what's the tricky thing about that process? Well, we have we have a bunch of Vs and we have a bunch of corresponding Ss, but Vmax and Km are buried inside of this nonlinear relationship, and it might not be. Um, we can't necessarily algebraically solve for them very easily, or um, and even if we did. How would we incorporate those values for all of the points to sort of take, in, take into account all of the data that we have to, to give constructive measurements for, for Vmax and Km prime? So how do, we, how do we take into account all of the data to get one estimate for Vmax and one estimate for Km? And how do we do so when they're buried in this kind of nonlinear relationship? Well, um, the first thing that we could do, so... Um, the first thing that we could do is we could just do nonlinear curve fitting. And the tool that we would use this, we'd probably do this in MATLAB or some other computational suite. And this is actually really the best way to do it. Um, but uh, we can sometimes do an alternative strategy where we can um, we can reformulate the equation where we can reformulate the equation to make it linear. So this is what I'm going to talk about um, during lecture today. And this will give us some intuitions about um, about how uh, how v and s affect, or how measurements of v and s affect v max and km. And your homework 
will involve uh, both this and the nonlinear curve fitting to extract a Vmax in Km. Okay, so let's proceed with uh, the second option here, where we can reformulate the equation to make it linear. So we have the equation V equals V max times concentration of substrate over Michaelis constant plus concentration of substrate. So um, is there a way that we can manipulate this equation to sort of uh, unbury this nonlinearity to kind of um, tease things apart to get something in the form of y equals mx plus b, where y is related to our measurements of uh, dpdt, or v, and x is related to our measurements of s. And once we have them in this linear form, then we can do um, we can do linear curve fitting, and that will give us m and b, and hopefully somewhere in m and b, that will give us Michaelis constant and and Vmax. But um, we need to be able to manipulate this equation in such a way that we can do so. Well, it turns out for this one, um, there's actually a not too difficult way to kind of unbury and make this uh, make this in a linear form. So we can do so by taking the reciprocal. So take a moment now, pause the video. Um, the left-hand side would, of course, look like 1 over v equals something. Um, take a moment now to pause the video and reformulate what the right-hand side would look. And see if you can get it in a form where you have slope and intercept in terms of Vmax and Km, and then x would be related to s. All right, so let's work it out. We can have, if we take the reciprocal of the left-hand side, we can take the reciprocal of the right-hand side too. Then we'd have Km prime plus s over Vmax times s. This would be Km prime over Vmax times s plus s over Vmax times s, which we could further simplify to Km prime over Vmax times 1 over s plus 1 over Vmax. And if we look at this, then we could know, note that m might just be this thing here. So if we um, have the slope of the 1 over v versus 1 over s curve would be this quantity. And then if we look at um, what happens when 1 over s is 0, that would be like the y-intercept. And that would basically be what b is up here. So this gives us a relation. So if we plot, instead of a relationship between v and s, if we plot what 1 over v looks like as a function of 1 over s, this should be 1 over v versus 1 over s should be linear. And any time you have a linear relationship, you could do a linear curve fit. And with a linear curve fit, we can very easily get an m and a b. Once we have an m and a b, it's not too hard to see how b would basically almost directly give us vmax. And then once we have vmax and m, then that would give us everything we need to figure out the Michaelis constant. All right, so where does that get us? Well, we know that a plot of 1 over v versus 1 over s should be linear. So now let's take a look at um, what that plot actually might look like. So we have 1 over v on the y-axis, 1 over s on the x-axis. Um, we're not really 
too, for the most part, we're not really too interested in what's going on over here, because that would imply that we have a negative concentration, nor are we interested in what's going down here, because that would imply that product is being consumed rather than being created. So we're mostly interested in what's going on in the uh, in the upper right quadrant. Um, where might the uh, so we, we'll we'll think now. Now the question is: Does it intercept the y axis or does it intercept the x axis? Well, let's think about it. What happens when one over s goes to zero? Well, when one over s goes to zero, that would imply what happens to s? s goes to infinity when 1 over s goes to 0. So what must 1 over v be when 1 over s goes to 0? Well, that must be um, 1 over v must be 1 over v max at that case. And we can see that in the relationship up here. If 1 over s is our x, is what's on our x-axis right here, then when this is zero, then one over v must be one over v max. And what's the slope of this thing gonna be? Well, km and v max are both qu positive quantities, so that means the slope must be positive. So we'll get a curve that looks like that. Now, what might the, the data points actually look like? Well, we're never gonna get all the way down to one over s going to zero, so we're gonna be close, but we're gonna have data points that look like that. So when we fit a line through our data points, then we'll be able to infer v max from this, and we'll also be able to infer, we'll know what the slope is from our fit line, and that slope will be km prime over v max. So once we know the intercept, we get v max. Once we know the slope, we get a relationship between km and v max, and once we have v max, then that gives us everything we need to get Michaela's constant. All right, so this is great, right? We have we have a way that if we have a bunch of s's and v's, we could compute pretty easily what the one over s's and the one over v's would be. Keep in mind v is dp dt, so this would be one over dp dt that we measure. We plot them. It should be linear. Um, we could then fit a line to it. When we fit a line to it, that gives us Michaela's constant and Vmax. So this is great, um, but this has utility beyond just giving a Km and a Vmax. This allows us to analyze in a quantitative way uh, what happens when initiators are present, or sorry, when inhibitors are present. So we talked, if we hearken back to um, the previous lecture, we could talk about three modes of inhibition. We could talk about we could talk about competitive inhibition. We could talk about uncompetitive. We could talk about uncompetitive inhibition, and we could talk about and we could talk about non-competitive inhibition. And there were different implications for each mode of inhibition and what the effect would be on our observed Vmax and our observed Michaelis constant. So um, so what happens when initiator when uh, sorry when inhibitors are present? Well, inhibitors are present, then we still get some relationship between our observed dpdt or our observed v and s. So it's still something of the form of something times s over something plus s, but instead we get a v max observed. That's v max observed, and we also get a km we get a km observed. And these observed values may indeed be the same as whatever there would be if there were no initiate, uh, inhibitor present, but 
if um, if there is a, some amount of inhibitor present, then Vmax and Michaelis constant might be altered uh, depending on what the concentration of inhibitor is. So these two things can uh, differ from they can in, they can differ from their no inhibitor values um, by a factor of 1 over 1 plus concentration of inhibitor over the um, the dissociation constant associated with the inhibitor sorry this is um, that's k sub i right here. So Vmax might uh, might be uh, fact scaled by this factor, or Km might also be scaled down. So as inhibitor, as concentration of inhibitor increases, then maybe Vmax decreases, maybe Km decreases, or may maybe they both decrease um, in the same way. And that depends on what mode of inhibition we have. So if you dig back in your notes, or look at the solution to the homework, we can, um, we actually developed algebraic relationships between what the concentration of inhibitor would be and what the observed Vmax would be and what the observed Michaelis constant would be. So for competitive inhibition, an increase in I causes an increase in our observed Km, but no no change to v to v max for uncompetitive inhibition an increase in the concentration of inhibitor caused a decrease in michaelis constant and a decrease in and a decrease in v max for non competitive inhibition an increase in uh, in inhibitor concentration caused no change to Km, but it caused a decrease to a decrease to Vmax. All right, so with these changes in mind, we can now figure out what the effect of inhibitor would be on what this plot would look like. So do, how do these plots change from their no inhibitor counterparts um, in the presence of inhibitor? So I'll move this up here so we can keep track of this stuff. And we can sketch out three different cases. So sketch All right, so first let's start with competitive. And we'll first draw what the no I would be. So take a moment now, pause the video, and add to this plot a sketch of what would the, what there would be if there were some amount of inhibitor. All right, so there's some amount of inhibitor. Let's look at um, this effect. All right, so there's no change to Vmax when there's an inhibitor. So what does that mean? Well, we we know we knew from before that the a uh, y-intercept was one over Vmax. So if there's no change to Vmax with competitive inhibition, so then they gotta have the same y-intercept. However, if we know that Km increases, then that means that the slope has also gotta increase. So 
So some amount of inhibitor would cause the curve to shift like this. So what does a, what does a higher curve mean? Well, if we, for the same amount of substrate, get higher values of 1 over v, then that's lower values of what v would be. So if we move up in this direction, then that's a then that's a slower reaction rate. So more inhibitor causes these curves to shift in a slower direction. All right, what's next on the menu? Well, what's next on the menu is uncompetitive inhibition. So we have this, uh, 1 over V versus 1 over S. And we'll start off with some no inhibitor present curve and add to this curve a sketch of what it would be uh, like if we added some inhibitor. So when we add some inhibitor, the curves end up looking like this. And what's, what's the deal with that, right? So the key thing here is that these curves have the same, they have the same slope, <coughs> um, but a different, but a different y-intercept, and in fact, a higher y-intercept. So what was the implication of that? Well, for uncompetitive inhibition, we lowered Vmax, which means we would raise whatever 1 over Vmax observed would be. Um, but there's no change to the slope. And the slope is the ratio of Km and Vmax, our or rather our observed Km and our observed Vmax. So if they have the same slope, yes, we change Km, but we also change Vmax by the same amount. So we change both of these things by a factor of this 1 over 1 plus inhibitor over the dissociation constant associated with inhibitor. And because we change both of these things by the same value, they end up with the same slope. But um, because Vmax is decreased, we now have an increase in the y-intercept or the 1 over Vmax when 1 over s approaches 0. All right, so now let's look at the last case. where we have non-competitive. We have non-competitive inhibition. So as before, we'll have a, uh, a sketch of 1 over V versus 1 over S. And, um, and we'll add to it the nominal case of no inhibitor. So take a moment now, pause the video, and add to this curve a sketch of what it might look like if we have some amount of inhibitor present. All right, so this is a little trickier. Um, we have no change to Michaela's constant, but we have a we have a decrease in Vmax. So if we have a decrease in Vmax, then we know we got to have a higher y-intercept. But if there's no change to Km and a, and a decrease to Vmax, then that means we increase the y-intercept, but we also increase the slope. So we increase y, and we also increase slope. So what's that going to look like? Well, that's going to look like something like this that has both a higher slope and a higher y-intercept. Um, now, so there's some inhibitor present here. So what's, what's the deal with here? Well, what's the same about these things? Well, there's no change to Km. So if we take a look at these things and we kind of project them into the region of chemical nonsense where we have negative concentrations, 
Um, they have the same They have the same x-intercept. And what is this x-intercept? Well, if you if you do out the algebra, the x-intercept is at um, negative one over is at negative one over Michaela's constant. So algebraically, we can put ourselves in this region where we have negative one over Michaela's constant. And because the Michaela's constant doesn't change, then that means that the x-intercepts of these two curves has to be the same. All right, so I sort of hinted earlier that this is a way to interpret quantitatively what the effect of um, substrate is on the time rate of change of product formation. And we can interpret things like the y-intercept and the slope, um, and that can give us information about Km and Vmax. So it turns out that in practice, this actually isn't a very good way to determine the Michaelis constant and the Vmax. You're better off going back and fitting, doing nonlinear curve fitting to fit this curve to this data rather than trying to fit a line to this data. And it's not always intuitive why that's the case. The reason is the linear fit is very sensitive to these last couple of points out here. And if you have noise on these last couple of points out here, that can very heavily influence what the slope and what the y-intercept of these values are. So because we want to avoid large sensitivity to just a couple of points and the noise associated with those couple of points, it's better off to fit a, non, a curve non-linearly in this original space, if we can, of v versus s, rather than this kind of goofy space of 1 over v versus 1 over s. And the homework that you'll be doing will end up uh, you'll end up exploring kind of what those differences are and how to actually implement, given some actual data of V and S, how to get um, some quantitative estimates for Michaela's constant and Vmax from that data using both the um, linear method and the nonlinear method. This, non, um, this method where we plot 1 over V and 1 over S is known as a... is known as a line weaver Burke plot. So when you construct a, a plot of one over V versus one over S, that is a line weaver Burke plot. Okay, so now we're gonna change gears a little bit and we're going to move on to the second point that we talked about um, in the intro to this class. So we talked about we just talked about how if you have data and you have paired measurements of substrate concentration and rate of product formation for this reaction, how we can fit Michaela's constant and Vmax to that data. So we just talked about that. Now we're going to take a step back. We're not going to look at the case where an enzyme is catalyzing a substrate to, for, to create a product, but we're just going to look at where a receptor and a ligand can bind together. There's some dissociation constant associated with that. and they can reversibly bind and unbind to form a complex or to reform the original products. So we're going to get algebraic relationships between this stuff and this stuff, and um, that incorporates the dissociation constant, and then we're going to algebraically manipulate those things to um, in a way that is analogous but not precisely the same as line weaver burke plots we're going to uh, figure out a way to make a linear version of this thing where the dissociation constant will become apparent all right so let's proceed with doing that So we're taking a step back. We're returning to So we're going to return to this reaction where we have a receptor and a ligand that reversibly bind to form a complex and there's some dissociation constant associated with with this reaction happening. So uh, we know in equilibrium In equilibrium, the dissociation constant is equal to reactants over products. 
So whatever our equilibrium concentration of ligand would be times whatever our equilibrium concentration of receptor would be divided by whatever our equilibrium concentration of complex would be. So there was this guy, I think he was like in the 1930s, um, his name was Scatcherd. And he wanted a way to say, hey, if I've measured some, some of these things or some of these things that are, or um, maybe not what the equilibrium values are, but, or maybe what some initial values are, can I take the measurements of these data and fit to it a KD? So, um, so Scatcherd proposed um, a... He proposed a manipulation of this equation and that would yield basically one over KD from that would uh, that would yield one over KD from linear curve fitting and the formulation he um, proved was basically to take this thing take its reciprocal and then multiply both sides by the equilibrium concentration of uh, of receptor. So take the reciprocal, that gives the equilibrium concentration of complex divided by the equilibrium concentration of ligand, and multiply both sides by the equilibrium concentration of, after you take the reciprocal, multiply both sides by the equilibrium concentration of receptor. So this would be one over KD times equilibrium concentration of receptor. Sometimes it's hard to measure what the equilibrium concentration of receptor is, so we can reformulate um, equilibrium concentration of receptor in terms of So we can reformulate this in terms of total receptor, R0, and equilibrium concentration of complex, CEQ. And how would we do that? Well, we know from conservation of species that any amount, that our total amount of receptor minus however much of that receptor is bound up in the complex has got to equal whatever the receptor that is unbound in equilibrium is. So. Um, so we still have this 1 over KD out front, and we have an R0 minus C EQ inside. So if we have a way to measure what our equilibrium concentration of complex is and what our equilibrium concentration of ligand is, then this gives us all of the information we need to construct this kind of goofy plot, but here it is, of C E Q over L E Q. So the ratio of complex um, to unbound ligand plotted against what the concentration of complex is in equilibrium. This plot should be linear, right? So if this is our Y, then, then our um, X is going to be this thing. So we're going to have a line. And this line is going to have a negative slope because we have a minus sign right here. So we're going to end up with something like this. So take a moment now. What is the slope of this? Well, the slope should, just should be 1 over KD, or rather negative 1 over KD. And what's the y-intercept? Well, the y-intercept would be up here. And this would just be R0 over KD. So if we have, so presumably we would know the initial concentration of receptor, but we might not. Um, so by knowing either the slope of this curve or the y-intercept of this curve, 
and knowing the initial concentration of receptor, that gives us all of the information we need to figure out what the dissociation constant for this system is. So for example, if we had a bunch of a bunch of data points and we knew what the concentration of complex was for each of these data points and also what the comp um, what the equilibrium concentration of unbound ligand was we could reconstruct whatever this y was and we could plot this thing versus this thing fit a line through it and that would give us all the information we need to figure out dissociation constant so this was a strategy that people did before the advent of computers, which made nonlinear curve fitting easier. So basically we would take a bunch of measurements of this, a bunch of measurements of this, and that would give us all the information we need to figure out KD. Now it's generally better to do some sort of nonlinear curve fitting um, in a way that is similar, but not precisely the same as um, we talked about for the line weaver Berg plots. Okay, so now we can move on to the third topic that we were going to discuss today. So we just finished talking about how if you have a receptor and ligand binding reversibly to form a complex, we can do some kind of goofy algebraic manipulations to the equilibrium equation for that relates to association constant to concentrations of these things. And if we plot stuff, that gives us a way that we can figure out KT from that. Um, an alternative way, or, or sorry, um, we might alternatively, instead of having receptors that have only one site to which a ligand can bind, we might have receptors that look like this, maybe having four or even more sites where the ligand could bind to each of these sites. And one tricky thing is if a ligand binds, let's say, to this site, does that affect how easily ligands can bind to any of these other sites? And, um, and what would be the effect on plots like this or some of the other behavior of these molecules. So let's explore that idea now. So what if a receptor has multiple sites to which ligands can bind and those sites could potentially affect the binding of one another? Well, just talking about a single just a single complex doesn't really make sense, right? Because we could imagine a complex that has RL, RLL, RLLL, RLLLL, or, you know, a whole bunch of those stuff. So there's really something like CRL, CRLL, C R L L L da, 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 da. and you can imagine, you know, there'd be any number of different complexes that could be forming. So rather than keep track of all these slightly different complexes from one another, we could um, it'd be easier it'd be easier to just report the total amount. of ligand of ligand bound so l bound would be something like c r l plus 2 times c r l l because there's two ligands in this complex plus 3 c r l l l plus da, 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 da. and you can imagine how we could continue this expression. So here we sort of only have one thing to keep track of, and it might be difficult to measure the differences between, you know, it might be difficult to measure RLL versus RL if these things don't behave too differently from one another or something like that. Whereas now we can just keep track of how much ligand um, is bound to any receptor. So with that in mind, we can modify the Scatchard equation. We can modify the Scatchard equation to incorporate um, the idea that multiple ligands could be bound to any particular receptor. 
So with that in mind, it becomes L bound, which is related to the, which is the number of ligands in any uh, complex divided by L, which is the free ligand in equilibrium. And this is equal to one over KD, which is a dissociation constant that kind of relates all of them. Um, and we could also have R naught minus L bound, but this R naught needs to be scaled because there are um, multiple sites that could exist on each receptor. So instead of R naught, we could say the number of sites per receptor times R naught, where NS is the number of sites per receptor. So if we plot um, the ligand that is bound in ratio to the amount of ligand that is free and compare that and plot that against the, the number of sites per receptor times the number of receptors, which is basically like the total number of things that could be occupied at all minus the amount of ligand that's bound to any particular receptor, then the slope of these things would be 1 over KD. So, um, but just this equation in itself doesn't really reveal how um, how one ligand binding could affect others binding. So, our idea is how can we describe Uh, how can we describe re whether a how can we describe whether a receptor with a ligand bound um, has more or less affinity? for other ligands in other in other sites. So to analyze this, we're actually going to bring up something that is similar but not precisely the same as the Langmuir isotherm that we brought up earlier. And this instead of having the quantity theta that described um, how what the fraction of or what fraction of occupied sites there were. Instead, we're going to have this quantity y bar, which is equal to the concentration of bound sites divided by the concentration of bound sites plus the concentration of unbound sites. So think for just a moment what this quantity y bar is really describing. So what y bar is really describing is the fraction of total possible sites that a ligand would be bound um, versus the number of uh, sites that are occupied. So it's really like of all the sites that could be occupied, how many sites are actually occupied? So it's really just bound over total, bound over total available. And this quantity um, is similar to theta that we used in in our analysis of the Langmuir isotherm. So what does um, so what what might we be interested in plotting? Well when we plotted theta uh, for the Langmuir isotherm, one of the most interesting plots is theta versus concentration of ligands. So let's see what that might look like. Um, for cases like this. So uh, 
we might be interested in instead of plotting theta versus concentration of ligand, we'd still have concentration of ligand on the x-axis here, but instead we'd have y bar. And we might, um, in some cases, the what would be the ultimate limit that y bar could be? Well, the limit for what y bar could be is if we had no unbound sites, if all of the sites were bound, then y bar would approach one. If there's no ligand, then we would have no bound sites and everything would be unbound, so we'd start at zero. And just as we noticed in some cases, for some multi-site receptors, we'll get something that looks just like what we had for the Langmuir, for the Langmuir isotherm. But sometimes what we observe is this kind of tricky case where um, the concentration doesn't rise very quickly with the amount of ligand that we have until we reach some kind of key amount and then it rises quickly. And then it kind of tapers off again. And then sometimes we also notice that we get something that rises even faster at the beginning, but then it kind of slows down and it takes really much more ligand to really fill up those last couple of sites than it would for, um, for some other cases. So we'll explore quantitatively why these curves might be the way they are. So in the past, when we had just one site, when we had just one site per receptor, we noticed that theta is equal to L over KD plus L. And that ended up being what this equation, this equation described this curve right here, where we had, um, once we had, if we had a ton of ligand, then basically the numerator and denominator approached each other, so theta became one. And if we had very little ligand, then we got zero over something finite, which was zero. And when L equaled the dissociation constant, that's when we had half of our occupied sites, right? That if L equals KD, then we get KD over KD plus KD, or KD over two KD. So what is this special point here? If we're at KD, right here, then we're at one half right here. Now, um, this was the case where we had one site per receptor. We can generalize this. We can generalize this equation to a more fancy version of this equation that is able to capture all three of these behaviors. And this general form of the equation is known as the Hill equation. And the Hill equation has a parameter that can basically affect whether we get this sort of lag, quick rise, and then taper off, or this sort of quick rise, and then a very slow approach to the, to the ultimate thing. And what that ends up being is y bar is equal to L to some exponent n over kd to some exponent n plus L to some exponent n. And we might ask ourselves, hey, is this still, are the dimensions going to work out, right? What if n is some weird fraction, right? Are we going to have weird units? But because we're raising everything to the n power, then the units are going to get also raised to some power, but we're still going to have units to some weird power n over some other units to some weird power n, so we're still going to have, the units are all going to cancel out, and we're going to end up with just a number for y, which is consistent with what we plotted here. So we're okay in that regard. So um, we could alternatively re, um, uh, manipulate this a little bit more to say, 1 plus L over KD to the N and L over KD to the N. So we could 
multiply both the top and bottom by 1 over kd to the n to get, uh, to get this expression. So why, um, what might be going on here? Well, if we notice, um, this, this expression still ends up being y bar equals 1 half when l equals kd because when l equals kd we still have we get ones right here and one to the n is still one so we still end up with one half so that's why all three of these curves still intersect um, till all of them end up being at a, at a concentration of kd they all have a y bar of one half but this exponent n affects what this kind of early behavior but this exponent of n this exponent n affects what the early and late behavior of these curves are. So take a moment now, pause the video, and yes, so if n equals 1 is going to be this curve, um, which curve is n greater than 1, and which curve is n less than 1? So, um, how can we relate that? Well, if n is um, if n is greater than one, that ends up being this red curve right here. And how might we say that? Well, when l over k d is slightly bigger than one, and we raise that to a power that's greater than one, then that becomes even greater than one. So for l over kd greater than 1, which is over here, then we expect to have a greater value than what this thing is, because we're squaring a number that's greater than 1, or raising a number that is greater than 1 to a power that is greater than 1. If we're at a l over kd that is less than 1, then we're taking a number that is less than 1 and raising it to a power that's greater than 1, so that's going to make it less than whatever just that number would have been. So we end up with a, a quantity less than um, less than the n equals 1. And the opposite would apply for would apply for this quantity right here. So what does that so what is a physical interpretation for this? Well a physical inter interpretation for this is um, the more, The more ligands, the more ligands bound, then that increases. That increases affinity. So uh, if we don't have any ligands bound, it's actually really hard to get those first couple of ligands bound. But then once we start getting some ligands bound, then more and more and more ligand can bound until we start occupying all of the possible sites. And then at that point, we've, you know, we got to taper this off because we're saturating things at that point. Conversely, um, this one would be more, more ligand bound decreases. decreases the affinity of the ligand. So when there's no ligand bound, it's super easy for those first couple of ones to bind. But once we get more, um, once we start getting more and more uh, ligand bound, um, it's really hard to get those last couple of ligands to bind because not only are there fewer receptors available, but those receptors have all been kind of deactivated by all of the ligands that are already um, to the point. So this is kind of like a gatekeeping phenomenon. So what do we call this? We call this negative cooperativity. And we call the case where n is greater than 1, we call that positive cooperativity. And we can interpret um, negative and positive cooperativity in the context of scattered plots as well. So if we return to 
so we can see so we can defeat we can see the effect of cooperativity on a plot of fraction of sites that are bound as a function of concentration and how that deviates from just the um just the one site per receptor case or the case where there's neither positive nor negative cooperativity and we can see how um how that affects the kind of early and late binding behavior or the low concentration and high concentration binding behavior of ligand but alternatively we can also interpret things in the context of a scattered plot and those end up being deviations from that line as well so uh, so what does that look like well p 